started. Very good. Welcome everyone once again. We have a very rich and saturated schedule that just doesn't seem to stop. Keeps getting better and better. And I will uh, welcome our guest speaker, Fotini Downey Robinson. Um, I will read a biography, a brief one to introduce her, and we'll take it from there. Passionate about the musical traditions of the Eastern Orthodox Church, soprano Fotini Downey Robinson is on the forefront of today's Orthodox music scene as a leader, teacher, and practitioner. She runs a private voice studio, Ephos Music, which is dedicated to the instruction of healthy vocal technique within the context of Byzantine chant and other types of liturgical music. Equally at home in the choir loft or as a soloist, Fotini has decades of experience as a church musician, professional ensemble artist, and secular performer of a wide variety of genres and styles. Fotini is the Lambadarios second cantor at the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Portland, where she leads the left analogion and assists with the parish choir. She is a touring artist with the internationally acclaimed vocal ensemble Capella Romana and also serves on their board of directors. She is on the faculty of the Artifact Institute and is a regular singer on the roster of the Grammy-nominated St. Tichon Choir, led by Benedict Sheehan. Fotini is one of the leading advocates for integrating women into the classical tradition of the Celtic art and is deeply committed to the education, training, and support of all singers who desire to participate more fully in the liturgical life of their parishes. Fotini earned her Bachelor of Music and Vocal Performance from DePaul University School of Music in Indiana. She also holds a Certificate of Byzantine Music from the Hellenic College Holy Cross School of Theology, where she received an excellent score, the highest possible distinction. She is currently pursuing a Master of Divinity at the Portland Seminary with a specialization in ecumenical chaplaincy and pastoral ministry. I recall turning to uh, Fotini with an invitation, and I still have warm recollections of her enthusiastic response. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, it's, it, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. And let's give her a warm welcome, please. And we do that this way. <laughs> Thank Please you. Take it Thank away. you so much, uh, Dr. Yamaha. This is such a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to dive, dive right in. <clears throat> Distinguished colleagues, friends, reverend fathers, organizers, sponsors, faculty, and participants of this most joyous and important endeavor, the 2021 Orthodox Music Masterclass. I'm so deeply honored to be here with you today, thanks to the wonders of technology. Uh, I had prepared to introduce myself a little bit, but uh, Dr. Yarmohoff gave such a, a thorough introduction that I, I have very little left to say. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for inviting me to share some of the thoughts and observations I've collected over the years from my perspective as both student and teacher at the Cleros. And uh, I use the term Kleros loosely here to represent the heart of your music ministry, wherever that might occur. That could mean the analogion, the choir loft, the pews, or any combination of all of the above. The great and holy Orthodox Church is a feast for the senses. The moment you step inside the church, the smell of incense invites you into the presence of the divine. The narthex welcomes you with colorful gilded icons that feel simultaneously intimate and otherworldly. Perhaps you light a candle and press it into the soft sand as you recite the Jesus prayer. The Kleros is where, as the cherubic hymn reminds us at every divine liturgy, we mystically represent the cherubim. 
This is the place where we lift our voices to God alongside the angels and the saints. The kleros is the hub that unites the clergy with the laity, the earthly with the heavenly. It is a place of holiness and a place of connection. We as liturgical music leaders play a central and critical role in the spiritual well-being of our parish life. Think about that. In other words, music ministry is inextricably linked with pastoral ministry and must be viewed in that light if it is to be effective as a means of transmitting the teachings of the church through its hymnography. Today, I'd like to discuss some of the common challenges you might face in your own ministry and share some ideas about how to navigate those in a way that embraces a spirit of service to God and to your community. So what is our job as church music leaders? Well, the specifics might vary according to the size and the demographics of your parish. But the primary function of the Orthodox music director is to make sure that the hymnography of the church is communicated to the people as clearly and as beautifully as possible, taking into consideration the resources and limitations of our own unique communities. In the same way that icons provide us with visual windows into the divine, our liturgical music should transport us into a prayerful space through delivery of the sacred texts. By singing, as opposed to simply speaking the hymns of the church, we elevate the transmission of these sacred texts above the ordinary. We adorn them with the colors of melody, rhythm, and phrasing. For this spiritual food to properly nourish us, the music must be skillfully composed and executed. Anything less becomes a distraction. Singers and parishioners must feel connected to the music and to each other. If that connection is present, it will expand to fill the church. In a miraculous transformation, the choir becomes the resonator that makes audible the silent vibrations of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. The choir becomes the resonator that makes audible the silent vibrations of the Holy Spirit. And it is through that lens by which we must understand that church music leaders must possess not only the technical skill for their craft, whether a singer, director, or composer, but also must have the spiritual sensitivity to facilitate such a connection. The important takeaway here is that effective church music requires both skill and openness of heart. Without knowledge of the musical tradition and the skills required to execute it, the offering may be heartfelt, but lacking in substance and a sense of connection to the past. Conversely, a technically proficient rendition that lacks a spirit of humility and prayerful supplication becomes a concert at best. Again, this is analogous to the experience of enjoying a painting at a museum versus praying at an icon. The music should transport us into union with God and not exist for the sake of its own admiration. This interplay between quality and religious reverence is a common theme in the liturgical arts, especially among the Eastern Orthodox and even more particularly when it comes to music. Unlike iconographers or liturgical tailors, for example, musicians create an experience rather than a product. The musician, like the priest, must offer the same gift over and over again week after week. When the doors of the church close, the icons, vestments, and altar cloths remain in their designated places. But music is ephemeral. It is only present while it is being made. As such, music becomes a unique offering of the people within a physical community. Icons and vestments are most often commissioned from professionals in other cities, sometimes even other countries, and shipped to their per permanent homes. And while a congregation might be happy to welcome guest musicians on occasion, the day-to-day -day music has to be a reflection of the people who live, work, and pray within that community. 
Therefore, we have a responsibility as music leaders in close partnership with our clergy and parish councils to be approachable and inclusive of, of our own people. There's a delicate boundary between maintaining a certain level of quality and finding the right seat at the table for everyone who wants to be there. To offer you a little context, I'd like to share some of my personal story. Like some of you here, I grew up in a Protestant family. We went to a Presbyterian church in suburban Detroit with a thriving music program. My parents were both active in the choir, and by the time I was 10 years old, I had the Hallelujah Chorus memorized, as well as many of the oratorio masterworks that were favorites of the chancel choir. As a child, I studied piano and flute, and I had performed in recitals and contests for as long as I could remember. I added voice lessons as a teenager and was active in choir and musical theater. My entire musical context at that time was about competing and excelling. Solo and ensemble festivals, youth scholarship competitions, college auditions, the gentle and not so gentle reminders that if I didn't practice, there would be lost opportunities. High school turned into college and it was more of the same, more contests, opera auditions, juries, junior and senior recitals, and finally a degree in vocal performance. Woohoo, I made it. But then what? Well, I did the only thing I knew how to do, more auditions. I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio and sang a few seasons with the Professional Vocal Arts Ensemble. Then my day job rerouted me to Southern France for a short time, and eventually I landed in Portland, Oregon, which has been my home for the past two decades. It didn't take me long to connect with Capella Romana, an ensemble with which many of you are familiar. For those of you who don't know, Capella Romana is a professional vocal ensemble that specializes in diverse expressions of sacred music from the Christian East and West from medieval Byzantine chant to premieres of works by living composers, such as our very own Father Ivan Moody, from whom you had the privilege of hearing just a couple of hours ago. My first few years with Capella felt just like any other professional gig. There was the packet of music to learn before the first rehearsal, and while everyone was very collegial, there was the unwritten rule that if you couldn't keep up with the demands of the project, you likely wouldn't get hired again. Fortunately, I was hired again, and now I've been with the group for almost 15 years, hard to believe. Because Capella fills a very specialized niche, it's impossible to be a regular artist on their roster without being fast-tracked into Eastern Orthodoxy. I had long been making rounds on the Portland liturgical circuit. I did Gregorian chant at the Latin Catholic Mass. I substituted for staff singers at every mainline church in town. I even sang the High Holy Days at the local Jewish temple. But what began as an initial fascination with the exotic sights, sounds, and smells of the Orthodox Church eventually transformed into an intimate and powerfully personal connection. Before I could fully comprehend the enormity of what was happening, I understood, at least on some level, that my relationship to the Orthodox faith far transcended any sense of professional obligation. In other words, it was more than just a gig. Fast forward a few years, and believe me when I say that the spiritual formation that transpired in those years could easily be the topic of its own talk. I was chrismated in 2015 with our dear Father Ivan as my sponsor. At that time, just months shy of my 40th birthday, I had never known a musical context where quality and professionalism were not the highest priorities. On the conveyor belt of projects that I had experienced, musicians were hired who could meet the demands of the repertoire, and over time, those singers developed a sense of community with each other. I had never seen that happen in reverse, that is, beginning with an intentional community and then building a program to serve and sustain the people who chose to invest in it. Those are two very, very, very different things. In any case, naive as I was then, I thought that being a singer in Capella Romana would give me a certain street cred in Orthodox churches. Newly chrismated, I was eager to get to know other Orthodox musicians and assumed that we would have an instant point of connection, right? Well, in some cases, yes, but it wasn't nearly as simple as I had imagined. And in retrospect, it shouldn't have come as a surprise. 
what I discovered was a surprisingly nuanced tapestry of complications within the Orthodox music community. To my eye, it seemed fraught with layer upon layer of internal complexity between jurisdictions, within jurisdictions, and even within single parish communities. Having grown up Protestant in the 80s and 90s, I was accustomed to the liturgical style wars over classical music versus praise bands and how to keep church music relevant for the next generation. But that all seemed quite mild when compared with the common Orthodox clashes having to do with ethnic and cultural identity, immigration, and generational differences that seemed to be about so much more than just age. I found that in many cases, my experience as a professional musician made it more difficult for me to establish trust with the faithful I encountered. Many of them seemed to expect that I would judge and belittle them, that I would question their musical sensibilities, their capabilities, and their level of sophistication. I encountered a defensiveness in many of our parish musicians, and I've now heard enough stories and had enough experiences on my own to understand why. The truth is that many volunteer musicians have had unpleasant encounters with professionals, and there is a very real divide that is dangerous and, in my opinion, unnecessary. I believe this can heal with time if we are willing to address two fundamental misperceptions. First, and I can't say this enough, there is nothing unholy about aspiring to create high quality church music. Piety is not achieved by dumbing down the received tradition because it is perceived as being too fancy or inherently ostentatious. Our churches are some of the most ornately decorated buildings in the world. With great care and at great expense, we hire skilled designers, iconographers, artisans, and laborers so that our worship spaces can inspire us out of the mundane and lift us closer to the perfection of heaven. Why should music be any different? Orthodox music, whether from the Byzantine or Slavic tradition, comes to us with a rich and complex history. Liturgical musicians who are well-trained aren't trying to show off for the sake of their own self-importance, at least most of them. These are people who have prayerfully devoted themselves to their craft in service to God's kingdom. And we would be right to remember that great skill can and often is exercised in a spirit of humility. All of us here understand what it means to offer a sacrifice of praise. The countless, often inconvenient hours we have collectively spent studying, composing, listening, practicing, teaching, and preparing for services are not in vain. Those servants of God who possess the knowledge and the capability to bring sophisticated repertoire to life in a beautiful way should be celebrated. They are an asset to your community and not a threat. If you are lucky enough to have high caliber musicians in your program who are willing to serve, please encourage their input and their active participation. We should always strive to attain the highest level of beauty that is within our reach. Secondly, and conversely, there can be profound beauty in simplicity. Advocating for simplicity is not decisively anti-intellectual, nor should it be interpreted as an unwillingness to learn and grow. A wise and well-trained leader knows how to choose literature that plays to the strengths and capabilities of the ensemble they have. Trying to force a challenging setting that is truly out of reach will only be an exercise in frustration. This is especially true if that same setting might have been magnificent decades ago, but no longer fits. These are some of the hardest conversations to have, but the most important ones in order to ensure the long-term vitality of your music ministry. That said, do not underestimate your group's capacity for growth. If they want to learn more sophisticated material, you can continue to help them grow into it as commitment and competencies increase. It also doesn't have to be the same all the time. 
If you have some musicians who want more of a challenge, try experimenting with different combinations. Maybe you let an advanced singer take the occasional communion verse or cherubic hymn. Give your choir the occasional Sunday off and use a quartet or a small ensemble. Getting your parish used to some amount of sonic variety gives you more freedom to experiment and keep your musicians engaged. It also exposes your parishioners to different sounds and it makes it easier to introduce new settings in the future. So how do you increase your singer's capabilities? How do you recruit, retain, and develop the musicians in your community? The answer is training. Quite frankly, I have been shocked at how little training is offered at the parish and metropolis level for the purpose of developing new chanters, particularly in the Greek and Antiochian parishes where they are expected to learn different tuning and notational systems. Thankfully, this is starting to change, but even with the new music schools and training opportunities that are starting to crop up, I've seen very little buy-in at the parish level. It used to be that children would learn at the feet of the master, but in the United States, that approach has not succeeded in producing enough knowledgeable chanters to serve our parishes and teach the next generation. Increasingly, musicians at the Kleros are adult converts to the faith and or women who haven't historically been allowed to serve, or at least were not encouraged, even if they were raised in the faith. We need to find new ways of transmitting this knowledge to all singers who have a desire to invest in the tradition. Too often, there are people who want to serve, but they have no one to guide them. When I was first put in charge of the chanting at my parish, I was a relatively new convert who'd had half a class in Byzantine theory, a handful of medieval projects with Capella, and zero clue about service rubrics. I begged our parish leadership to hire someone to mentor me, but they thought I was good enough. Honestly, I was not good enough. I was a mess, and rightly, in those early days, a disappointment to many. Thankfully, by the grace of God and also the necessity of COVID, my teacher was hired as our protopsaltis, and I finally had the opportunity to watch and learn how to serve properly. I went on to earn my chant certificate from Holy Cross, an accomplishment that never would have happened without that on the job training, consistent exposure to a top shelf canter, and the weekly nudge to keep growing into the vast tradition of the Psaltic art. So what about compensation? Well, how important is it that you have a quality music program that enriches your parish life not only by providing beautiful hymnography, but that also serves as the heart of your community. How important is it to have someone in charge who has the requisite training, knowledge, experience, and people skills to embody that source of connection we described earlier? Just as it isn't somehow less spiritual to select high quality music, it isn't unorthodox to monetarily compensate someone who has the proper skills, training, and enthusiasm for the job. Quite the opposite is true. When you pay someone, even a modest amount, you acknowledge the value of their work. You also free them from the necessity of earning their entire living through another source, which then enables them to devote time and emotional energy to the needs of the parish. Vocational training, whether for the church or for any other specialized craft, takes a huge personal investment of time and money. If there is no return on that investment, the unfortunate reality is that only musicians who are able to pay out of pocket or who are lucky enough to find sponsorship can take advantage of the development opportunities that are available to them. Even if they do serve a church, they will likely have to shoulder those responsibilities on top of the demands of a day job that pays the bills. Capable church leaders are cultivated through a combination of talent, humility, commitment, investment, and a selfless desire to serve. It's easier to teach practical skills to a prayerful spirit than the other way around. 
just because someone may have had a few violin lessons in the fifth grade doesn't equip them to lead a music ministry. Our leaders need some basic level of vocal technique, conducting and rehearsal management skills, and sight reading fluency in at least one notational system, if not two. On top of being highly organized, energetic, diplomatic, personable, and of course, a member in good standing of the Orthodox faith. In my experience, volunteer musicians are much more likely to make a serious commitment to the musical life of the parish if there is paid professional leadership. The paid director doesn't always have to be the best musician in your church, although solid skills and a desire for continued growth are critically important. It's also about responsibility, commitment, and the time that person is willing and able to invest in the ministry. The key to success here is finding someone who not only possesses the musical training, but also the soft skills, diplomacy, resourcefulness, approachability, good communication with clergy and with volunteers, and the ability to attract and retain personnel. Volunteers want leaders who set clear, meaningful goals and a pathway for achieving them. So long as they feel respected and valued, they will continue to serve joyfully, no matter how busy they might be with other commitments. Having at least one good music leader on your church staff and payroll is one of the smartest investments you can make in the life of your parish. Let's talk a little bit now about style silos, as I like to call them. We all know people who insist that there is only one right style of Orthodox Church music. And this is more of an issue in some jurisdictions than in others. For example, in the GOA, it's a huge problem in some parishes where there we are seeing a dangerously toxic us versus them mentality between the choir people and the chant people. This is understandable and perhaps even healthy in the long run, as long as we find ways to address and ease the growing pains. It is the natural result when enthusiasm for something new rubs against fear of change and more on that later. And made worse when there is a lack of diplomacy and respect, either by genuine ignorance or by intentional malice. And I have seen both. It takes intentional effort to reach out of the cocoon of our own perspective and understand the emotional space of someone with a vastly different lived experience. In 21st century American orthodoxy, we are heirs to a vast and ever growing body of high quality liturgical music. The key is to know your own parish. What is the music that best serves the priorities of your community? The answer to that question needs to be led by your priest, but he needs your input and ideas. Maybe congregational singing is a priority, for example, that will inform your selections. What if you are trying to serve multiple constituencies under the same roof? This too can be done well without making your worship experience too disjointed or jarring. For example, you could have a mostly Byzantine service, but use a rich polyphonic setting of the Megalinarion or communion verse. In whatever way you choose to arrange it, your goal should be to unify and not to divide. Certainly, our worship experiences should not require a particular soundtrack to fill us with God's grace. Additionally, Polyphonic choirs need to honestly assess if their settings are still appropriate for their size and capability. Chanters should see themselves as part of a larger music ministry and work closely with the choir leadership. Too often the choir and the chanters end up on their own little islands with little to no interaction. To the extent you can, establishing goodwill and cross-pollination between your choir and chanters can go a long way. The ideal solution is to have at least one or two people who participate in both. So now I'd like to pay a visit to the biggest elephant in the room, how to navigate change within a community. We've all been part of change in one way or another, sometimes as the initiator, other times as the enforcer, 
and most likely at some point as the one kicking and screaming. The, the three things to remember are empathy, creativity, and a sense of humor. There will always be people, always, there will always be people who are resistant to the choices made by your church leadership. It is impossible to please everyone. But when you are approached by someone who is unhappy, as you inevitably will be, try your best not to get defensive. Listen to them. Hear them. Ask if there is something you could incorporate that would bring them joy. It might be simpler than you think. I once had a complainer of a certain age who was upset about the Lenten Megalin audio night shows. I explained that it was the traditional setting, which was true, of course, in the context of Byzantine chant. He got indignant and he said, no, that is not the traditional setting. I smiled and reached for his hand and asked if he could hum a few bars of the melody he knew. He did clearly pleased to have been asked. And I recognized the melody as one that would have been popular with his generation. And it made me realize that traditional is all about context. So it becomes a question of whose tradition. So the following Sunday, I did his traditional setting and made a friend for life. I wish you could all have seen him beaming from the pews. Just adding that one piece to the rotation helped him feel connected and valued, and that made him more open to accepting other settings that weren't his favorites. Change is inevitable and always hard, but it can be, it can, it can be managed with a measure of diplomacy and person-to-person -person connection. In no particular order, I'd like to share some strategies that will help you lead change with a minimum of pushback and hard feelings. Take change slowly. Take the time to understand why things are the way they are. Maybe there is something special and unique to the parish history that you don't know or fully understand. Don't be that person who comes in and bulldozes everything they know and cherish. And remember, just because something is old doesn't make it irrelevant. And just because something is new doesn't make it better. Don't make change personal. Take care not to imply that people are stupid or uneducated or provincial because they don't understand your approach. Remember that music is driven by emotion and not logic. Ask about their concerns and listen to their answers. Go the extra mile to get to know them. Ask about their families, their activities, interests, pets. Establishing personal relationships and seeking ways to connect outside the scope of your disagreement can do wonders for the collective health of your parish. Work with your clergy and parish council to determine the mix of languages and styles that is right for your parish, so it isn't just about you. Explaining that you are upholding a directive from your leadership can help, so long as you don't say it in such a way that throws your priest under the bus. Try to present a unified front, and if you really do disagree with the initiative, maybe the issue requires more discussion. Establish good communication between your chanters, choir leadership, and clergy. This works to everyone's advantage and makes everything easier, trust me. If there is something, ask, ask if there is something specific you can do to help ease the transition. Remember the story I told a few minutes ago about the parishioner who took issue with my traditional megalinarium? That is a perfect real world example that shows how beautifully this approach can work. As we rebuild our music programs post COVID, many parishes are asking how they can use this opportunity to reassess the needs of their communities. Don't be afraid to talk with others. Networking events such as this conference are superb for that. Share ideas and ask for help. Remember that most of the challenges we face are not unique to our own churches. Seek out the experience and support of your colleagues. 
Finally, I would be remiss if I concluded my talk without briefly addressing a topic that comes up again and again in my work as a voice teacher. My students are diverse in age, jurisdiction, and profession. In addition to chanters, I teach priests, deacons, chaplains, professors, choir directors, and many more. One of the most surprising things I have observed in my teaching is that most, if not all, of my students and colleagues have confessed to feeling some degree of imposter syndrome. And it stands to reason, many of us were thrust into service before we were ready. We felt as though we were forced to build the plane while flying it, feigning confidence as we fumbled around in the dark. Does this resonate with you? How many of us have been called at one point or another into a leadership role that was beyond us? How many times have we felt that we simply weren't good enough? We are taught in Orthodox theology that God calls us even in our unworthiness to do miraculous things. The Gospel of Luke reminds us that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. With proper humility and the willingness to learn and grow, we are always good enough. Do the best you can with what you know today without fear. Ask for God's help and he will give you the strength you need, I promise. And so by way of our prayerful service at the Kleros, we become the vessel through which God's divine work is accomplished. No more and no less. Thank you. Thank you, Fotini. That was deeply moving and so, so relevant to so many of us who are struggling with our realities on the Kleros. Um, just spoke to those realities so eloquently and with so many strategies and possibilities for change. Thank you for that. Thank and, you. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions now. Um, yes, Father Ivan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fotini, for that uh, eloquent testimony. Um, uh, as someone who's shared part of your journey, um, uh, it's very moving to hear it expressed in, in this way and um, to hear about the uh, concrete results uh, of, of, of a spiritual journey. Um, I have to say, uh, <laughs> I particularly liked your concluding segment. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fake Russian, I'm a fake Serb, I'm a fake Greek. Um, I'm a real Brit and actually a real Portuguese as well, but, uh, you know, and I say this as a priest as well, you know, I mean, I'm a fake Saltis, I'm a fake choir director. Uh, these functions, very often before we're ready for them, and you know, the, on the other hand, uh, God puts us in these positions because he wants us to learn on the job. Um, so, so there's 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 a kind of um, there's a balance here to be enjoyed if if we can make the most of it. Um, the problems arise, as you so uh, uh, eloquently said, when there are uh, divisions within a parish because of stylistic matters. Or and and I'd mentioned this before, but you said it again. Uh, the, the generational question. Um, this is not just polyphony versus chant, but I think in the GOA particularly, polyphony versus chant is the, uh, the, 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 the most eloquent expression of this problem, let's say. But it in, it, it in fact happens everywhere. So um, I have no um, other comment to make, other, but I just wanted to uh, thank you and, and uh, endorse what you've said uh, 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, I have a question. First of all, I want to thank you. He brought tears to my eyes. 
because I, I, I identify as one of those imposters that was thrust into it and has had to learn over the years. And thank God for a lot of support from my singers and my priest. But um, I find that I'm not a trained music, a choral a vocal a musician. <clears throat> so I find that um, I don't feel comfortable teaching people solfege and just, you know, this is two beats, this is one beat. And, you know, at least in America, fewer and fewer schools have music programs. You know, fewer and fewer people sing. So the level of music knowledge is just so low. And for adults showing up into a choir um, who say, I love to sing. Yes, I can sing on pitch, but I don't really know how to read notes or what, what do you do? Do you have a class that you teach them or how, how do you handle that? Um, yeah, that's a really good point that not as many people are getting music uh, in school. And when I first um, sort of arrived on this scene, I knew a lot of people who were trained, uh, trained even professional musicians, and they could read staff notation like nobody's business, but they didn't know Byzantine notation, right? So just because somebody even has that training doesn't necessarily mean that they have exactly the right training to just step in immediately and, and um, you know, and serve depending on the culture of that particular parish. Um, so I think the best approach, well, I've got two answers. The, the more general answer is I think that churches and, um, and at, at the metropolis level need to recognize this. I think there is this idea somehow that musicians just kind of drop from the sky and that um, there's, there's no particular training necessary. And I think parishes are just now starting to see as they're really struggling, some of them to find musicians who are willing to serve and who have that training. Um, we're starting to see from inside that we need to provide that training. And that is starting to happen with, again, I, I mentioned some, some schools and, and private studios and, and means. There are now ways of getting that information for the people who want it. Um, but I also think because I mentioned there's so much variation from parish to parish in terms of the actual skills that are needed, each parish needs to take responsibility for that and either um, provide a space and maybe that means a, a bit more salary to, to provide to, to ensure that the people who are qualified have the wherewithal to do this, uh, find teachers from within the parish, or if there are not teachers within the parish who are able to teach or willing or have the skills and bandwidth, um, for parishes to start becoming aware of these resources that we have, the schools and, and the, the teachers that are available, and start underwriting uh, some, some of the people who want to, um, you know, to want to learn. Um, yeah, I can go on, but I, that's, that's the short answer. I, I want to address something I'm seeing here in, in the chat. Uh, someone has asked, what is the GOA wording and practice, uh, the difference between chanters and choir? Is the choir singing polyphonic music and parts and the chanters do traditional Byzantine chant? I was intentionally vague about that because I think until recently, the assumption has been that you have your chanters who kind of do this thing over here and then you have your choir that does Four, four part or you know some some sort of polyphonic music and I think that's one of the things that we're really going to start to see changing um, a Byzantine choir is still a choir and I think we need to get away from this assumption that if you use the word choir that that automatically implies that you're reading staff notation that you're using western tuning that you're that you're doing polyphonic arrangements. 
because I think that's part of the terminology that gets us into trouble. Um, and so I like to use the word choir to mean a group of people who are singing together. Now, obviously, depending on your context and depending on your setup, you may need to make a different distinction between and having the word choir mean your polyphonic group. But that's one of the things that I think is important to talk about and important to acknowledge that Byzantine shank choirs are still choirs. I, I did actually reply to that uh, question in the chat because I think it's not clear to people unfamiliar with the um, with the GOA setup exactly what that conflict is. Um, uh, certainly for Russian parishes, <laughs> this idea is weird. Why yeah. would that, so um, it's important to have this because the context is uh, 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 squared off chant melodies that were brought to the United States by a certain generation of Greeks and then harmonized because they wanted to be they wanted to have choirs like the Protestants. That's why you have pews and organs in churches as well. And there's a whole history to go with that. And now these things belong to that generation. And what's seen as newfangled by these people of, of Byzantine chant, which is what Fortini has been involved in, though with a delicate um, 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 uh, approach that does not... Any other questions? Don't be afraid to speak up. I, I just want to say thank you so much and echo. Wow. Wow. I mean, the way that you put everything we've all experienced in and you've um, just put it all so beautifully and with such sensitivity to um to people's hearts and their experiences and validating people and really um as a unifying force we, we need to be trying to unify our communities and um there i think there has been people uh non-professional volunteers have been devalued by professionals and Professionals have been devalued by volunteers because <laughs> everybody's defensive, yeah. you know, and right. and I, I had a priest once say to me that, you know, musicians, they just have so much ego that it's all about the ego. And I was like, no, we're not. And then, <laughs> you know, the yeah. more I thought about it, I went, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all want it. We all want to be validated. We want to be useful. We want to be able to contribute and the more we can validate each other um we can we can get there slowly and i just think it's it's crucial because we can't learn if we do, we can't learn if we don't feel validated we can't help each other if we're not validating people and their effort and their desire and their love for god and it, you know, all of this talk about excellence is great. I mean, we want excellence, but that doesn't mean we're not good enough. Like you said, that was so critical. We are good enough because God has put us here and we're, we're doing what we can. And it's just really about, are we doing what's responsible in our time and place? And that's hard. It's hard to always know, am I doing what God wants me to do? with this That's position, very hard. with this choir, you know, anything. So it's, it's very hard. And the only way to move forward with change, which again, is, is just always a difficult thing, even if it's something you want, even if even if you support the end goal, that doesn't mean that change is easy. And um, especially when you have this perceived division that you have different camps that want a different end goal. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think, I don't think it's a stretch to say that everyone has the same larger end goal in the sense that they want to be unified as a community. They want to 
feel that their own experience is valid and means something. And I think sometimes we make a bigger deal out of these divisions than, than we need to. Because once again, I keep coming back from the, the uh, back to the story about that Megalinarion and the parishioner who incidentally was one of the people who really uh, was very unhappy when I started doing this work. Uh, he complained loudly to the church leadership that I was a convert, I was a woman, I was this, that, and the other thing. And he didn't like the, the music I was doing and, and all of this. And honestly, all I had to do was just connect with him and seek him out and say, hey, I know that maybe you have some feelings about this and I would like to hear what they are and maybe maybe I can do some things that would make you happy. And I don't think anyone had ever reached out to him before. It really wasn't difficult. <laughs> now he's one of my biggest fans. He would, he would do anything for me. And it really didn't take a lot of effort. All it took was just showing up and asking him where he was and listening to him. Now, I, I know that's not always easy. That's not always easy. I, I, I definitely understand that. But it can be done, and it doesn't have to be as difficult sometimes as, as we think. Vlad's got some comments here in the chat about how, and this is my experience, every time musicians get together, we talk about this compensation issue. And it's hard to advocate for ourselves, but we have to advocate for ourselves. In fact, all the teachers, uh, you know, the California music educators, every issue of their, of their journal has an article on how to advocate for your music program. So it's universal. It's not, I don't think it's just in the church. Oh, no. But because you can't touch music, and like you said, it goes away. There's something about it that people don't want to pay for. And even a lot of musicians want all free music. So we're, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Um, and then we have this guilt, like, like, oh, I should be giving this to the church for free. But none of the other liturgical artists give everything for free. So it's a very touchy issue. And um, I do think we need to advocate. What I've learned is that the, the church community and the church board in particular has absolutely no idea of what goes into creating beautiful music. Uh, Alice and I did a, a big sheet and added up all the hours that we spend doing each task per for a liturgical year and um, all the things that we have to do as a part of that. And they were just blown away. They were like, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, you, it looks so easy to stand up there open your mouth and wave your arms around. But. You know, and you bring up a really good point. And um, I think that most of the time it really is an issue of not understanding. Most people who don't do it have no idea, really have no idea. They're not necessarily trying to devalue us, but it's, you know, my example of, of, uh, the priest identifying somebody as saying, oh, you had some violin lessons in the fifth grade, you should lead our music department, was not an exaggeration. I've seen, I mean, I think we've all seen things like that happen. And it's not, it's not that they're trying to be disrespectful. It's just, I mean, how many times have you talked to somebody who says, oh, I, uh, I know how to sing. And then you hear them sing, and it, it's, it's clear that while they may enjoy it, they've had no training. Um, I remember when, when I first stepped into this role at the church as the chanter, because there really was not anybody else who, who knew how to do it. Um, and I was tapped because they're like, well, you sing with Capella Romano, so you know how to chant. And I, I just, it was hard for me to know how to explain. I know how to take a folder of music and learn it for a concert. I don't know how to put a service together I don't know how to um, include volunteers and train them. I don't know how to, um, you know, there's so much I did not know how to do. I can do medieval chant, right? But that doesn't help me <laughs> in the received tradition, right? And so there are all these layers of knowledge that the people in, many of the people in these decision-making uh, positions really don't understand. So I think the key, just like so much, of what we talked about today 
is not to get defensive about it, but to educate them and show them the chart and say, I just want you to understand the things that need to happen in order for you to have this music so that they can see it and, and understand. And that's, that's how things change. When people, when the decision makers see the full picture. And if you don't advocate, if you don't show them, I mean, you know, prayerfully, of course, you don't want to be a jerk, but to the extent that you can just say, hey, I, this is what it takes, truly, so that they know. I think most priests want that information. And parish council, they want to know what you're doing for the church. So I think that's where it starts. I think to Ann Shep's statement, we need a guild, not guilt. Well, yes. And the tricky thing there, once again, I, I come at this from the GOA, which is a bit different maybe from some of you, but there is a guild. There's the, feder there's the church, um, the, the Federation of Greek Orthodox Musicians. Um, but even that has been problematic in recent decades because of how it's seen as a very specific camp of this polyphonic music and the young people don't wanna have anything to do with it. And I think that's really sad because that's why that group is there, right? And so this, there's, there's even, even when you create the guild, there has to be an acknowledgement of what the guild stands for and, and you have to take care not to have that guild become its own little club, right? Fotini, I wanted to emphasize the importance of advocating for the musical element with the parish council. I've been working as a choir director at a Greek Orthodox church in Chicago for 15 or 16 years, and it wasn't until the pandemic uh, removed me from my position uh, for 14 months did I realize how little the parish council knew about what my responsibilities were. They knew that they were cutting the check monthly, uh, and thank God they didn't stop cutting that check. I had to transition into publishing a newsletter for the parish and running the live stream in order to not lose that support that I do need. But through this period, I got to know the parish council members, and they became appreciative of the newsletter and the fact that we were live streaming all the services. I became a person to them <laughs> instead of someone up there who does something. Yes. And, and that, it, you know, it resonates with that connection you have with, with that individual who, who turned around. Um, and things, you know, uh, three weeks ago, the Metropolitan allowed us to return as choirs, and there was this resurgence of interest in, uh, of interest in music. People were coming up saying, I feel like I'm in church again. It's so good to hear the choir sing. And so the pandemic helped in that sense. But if I left and I didn't work with the parish council, all of that would have evaporated. So it, it's important to advocate and get to know the parish council members. That's, I think, where the advocacy begins. That, thank you for saying that. That is so hugely important. And just to, to tack something onto that, which just highlights something that you said and put a spotlight on it, is that so many people leave the church because they're frustrated because they're not getting what you what they want. And my first question when I hear about that happening to someone is, did you talk to anybody? Did you did you make known in a helpful sort of way how you felt you weren't being served? And did you make any suggestions for how you might be better served? Understanding of course that you're not the only one there who, who needs to be served. Um, and most of the time, the answer is, no, I just got so frustrated, I left. And my, um, 
my whole perspective is you can't do that. You have no business blaming the church for sort of forcing you out if you made no effort to try and be part of the solution. Now, it may be that you have advocated, you have talked to people, you have tried, and it's still not working out. So maybe that parish isn't a great fit for you or, or whatever. I'm not saying that it can always be resolved in that way. But um, to your point, Peter, I think that you can't, if you, if there was something going on for you that wasn't working, you were right to approach the parish council and say, hey, this is the situation, how can we work that out? And I think in most cases, the leadership, especially if they value you as a member of the community, will be happy to try and work with you and, and work something out. So you always have to try that first and not just assume that the, you know, the community is against you or they're unwilling mm -hmm. to try, because I think in most cases they will be willing to try. I have anecdotes that speak to this uh, situation <laughs> in different ways. Um, one relates to Fortini's Megalenarion story. Uh, but when back in London, when I was singing in the um, choir of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, when, when Metropolitan Anthony was still alive, um, the choir was directed by Father Mikhail Fortunato, and uh, every Pascha we sang this horrible Megalinarion, the, 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 the Makarov, Ange Vopiashe. I've always hated it. I, I, I just loathe the piece. And I said to Father Michael, Father, really, do, do we have to sing this piece every year? And he, he took me to the, but we were up in the gallery, he took me to the edge of the gallery and he said, look down there. If all those babushki do not hear this every year, they go away. We have no church. So I never mentioned it again. I understood his point. <laughs> but you see, that, that was a mass movement. It wasn't just one person. So it's a diff slightly different situation. But the other story I had in mind was here in Portugal, uh, before I was a priest, uh, I was the, the salty stroke choir director. And it, again, it was a Paschal occasion. And we used to have buses of Greek tourists turning up. And the one, one Easter, uh, uh, Orthros, uh, Pascal Orthros, uh, this short Greek guy wearing big thick glasses came up to me and he said, I chant really well. So I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he kept trying to sing everything. And I said, look, if you can't sing in Portuguese, don't sing. We are not just Greeks here. <laughs> we, we were a multilingual community. And then finally, I found something for him to do. I got him to sing the praises in the, <laughs> in the fourth class. But the point is, he thought he could march in and everything would be just the way it was at home. And, and I, uh, I, I'm thinking of this because of what Fortini said about um, you're just a cog in the machine. You know, I was there wearing a Salty's robe. I, I'm the guy in charge, in charge of what's being sung in principle, and, and uh, I should be noticeable because I'm wearing the robe. If, I, <laughs> if I'm just a kind of uh, pillar box, if I'm just a kind of um, uh, part of the decoration of the church, then you know, it's, there, there is something wrong, and those kinds of problems need, need to be addressed. So anyway, there you are, just two little stories. Thank you. I'm seeing some requests in the uh, in the chat for publishing this talk. I do have it um, in a Word document, so um, I can we can figure out a, a way to distribute that. But I'd be I'd be happy to put it out there. If if you have no objections, uh, Fotini, uh, we would like to also uh, present this to the public uh, as you presented it today. Uh, uh, you could you could review it and edit it perhaps and uh, but we could publish it on our YouTube channel. Um, that feels terrifying, but if you guys think <laughs> if you guys uh, think it would be uh, useful, I, I'm willing. To very useful, that. very useful for so many people to hear. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. 
We'll send it to every bishop. <laughs> I was just about to say that some of the higher arcs. I once, um, this was years ago, um, but, and it wasn't my priest, but I was talking with just somebody in the parish they happened to be on the council. Um, and I had just become the, the choir director and I was wanted some budget and all of this. And, and, and they were like, well, you know, they were just not hearing it. And I said, so, well, you know, eventually we need to develop this program. And, you know, so that someone that knows even more, that knows more than me can be the choir director that does this for a living, you know? And they said, and they were like, well, the deacon doesn't get paid. And I was like, I, I just didn't even know what to say, but it, it's like so clear to me. Now there's sometimes, so many times it's me and the priest. <laughs> you know, the deacon doesn't feel good and doesn't come. And, you know, and it just that, that playing off of one need against the other, I guess, is can sidetrack us or people can try to minimize what we're asking for. Yeah, it's, it's hard and it depends a lot on your particular parish once again. And um, not, not every parish is in a position to pay. And that's, I mean, that's just the reality of it sometimes. But I, I also don't like to emphasize that particular piece because it's amazing what, it's amazing when money can be found when the church sees it as a priority. Right, it's very easy to say, well, we can't afford this or that. And you might not be able to, right? But I think in some cases, it's just a matter of establishing it as a priority. And as was talked about earlier, make sure that the decision makers really have an understanding of what, your, what the expectation is, that you can't just decide to, to not to show up like the deacon maybe can in your situation. Make sure they know and understand and, you know, that that's the way it happens once they understand how important it is. I, I've also found that sometimes people are happy to contribute to more finite needs that may support the music program. I, what, Alice and I, you know, worked together for years and what we tried to do is just get a line item on there. So there's something on the budget for music. And then over the years, you try to <laughs> expand that line item into more. You know, maybe it starts out as uh, funds for travel to a, a seminar every summer or something yeah. like that, or new binders or whatever physical needs of the choir, maybe some education for the choir director. Um, and then maybe you start out with a tiny site. I mean, this is what happened with us. There was a year where uh, neither of us could actually be there. I had a baby and she had to help her husband's business and the presbytera took over the choir. Well, all of a sudden the priest knew how much it took to do the choir. And suddenly there was a line item in the budget for the choir. It was very tiny. Exactly. But, right. You know, after presenting uh, more recently, after presenting our, actual hours spent and jobs done we said can you guys can you guys make a plan for a gradual approach to a seller um, a stipend commensurate with what other professionals in the church are being paid we have a large community we have a school we have teachers we have people in the office that don't have college degrees getting paid to show up you know can you guys just work towards a goal every year, bump it up a little bit. And they actually like that idea. It's like, we're not asking for a salary to fall from the sky. Right. So, right. Yeah. you know, get your toe in the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, actually, I've actually seen the opposite too, where uh, choir directors have been offered a salary and they've turned it down because, oh, I, I can't accept pay for this. And if you feel that way, then I recommend that you accept the pay and give it back to the church because what exactly you do right. establish is the best. That is what and, I would say too. Yeah, the next person down the road may not feel that that sense of volunteerism. And I think it trains the church to at least 
even if it's a minimal amount to have that in the budget. That's a super important point, Kurt. I need to go because actually I have to go chant Vespers. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's 712. Thank you, Fotini. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure and I will, we will work out how to get that published for you all. Thank you. I think you have a bunch of new groupies right now. <laughs> well, thank you all for your interest. And um, for those of you here in the region, stay cool this weekend. It's gonna be very, very hot. So. We will. All right, thank you so much.